My name is Luis Gonzalez. I work with Oscilloquars. We are a frequency and timing company. We've been in the business for a little over 70 years. And the company was born on, one, on two premises, right? Making very accurate clocks and making them as small as they could be. And today, 73 years later, we're basically doing the same thing. Uh, traditionally, we haven't played much in the broadcast space, and most of you have never heard of us until probably a year or two ago. Uh, we played more in the very high accuracy, very specialized applications, underwater navigation, space investigation, research, metrology, those type of things, quite a bit in telecom. And now, with the whole evolution to IP networks and the growth of PTP, which is something that's been in our wheelhouse for about 15 years, a little bit more, then we found that we could contribute, or we think that we can contribute something to, to this industry. So I did change my presentation a little bit after the CIMT report that was presented on the first day, because there was some overlap. So I'm gonna try to focus a little bit more on protecting the source of time as opposed to the network distribution of time, where I think the report was very, very detailed in that aspect. So oh, let me try to figure this out. So I'm not here, <laughs> and this statement is meant to be a source of discussion. Uh, we've heard through the week, you know, different opinions on where we need to go with timing. Something is a fact, we do need timing. Now, how accurate? How do we distribute it? How do we get it? That's open for discussion, and I think there's very good arguments for all of the opinions that I've heard during the week. Uh, there's a good argument for you know, less requirements. Uh, there's a big argument for not synchronizing the transport network. All of these are valid, and it will depend on the application. So one thing that we do need to know is that there is a need for timing in the industry, and it's not only specific to the broadcast industry, so a lot of the concepts I'm gonna talk about are really applicable to any industry that's evolving from these wire-dependent technologies to some kind of IP Ethernet type of architecture, okay? So the other point that I did wanna uh, kind of present so we have the same basis for everything is the only really accurate way of getting timing today are the GNSS constellations, the GNSS networks. There are some redistribution centers or so uh, other centers like we have NIST in the US and we have you know, these uh, observatories across the globe, but we really monitor and distribute time. But if you go back to the standards and how we define time, we really all define it to what BIPN defines as the absolute time, right? So when we start talking about epochs and all that kind of stuff, it's all in reference to one absolute time that we have agreed, even though it's arbitrary, we have agreed that it's the, it's the only true time, okay? So we'll start with those two premises. So what I'm gonna discuss a, a little bit is how do we get that time? What happens when we don't get it? Because there are cases when we may not be able to get it. And how do we survive when those events occur? Um, so this is from a study, I think I presented a similar slide last year, uh, and it had a lot less detail. In this one, we see that, first we see, um, let me see. The, the biggest change we see in addition to many more sources of interference appearing what GNSS uh, reception or GNSS availability is, we see a big change in one of the parameters that was used for this study, which is spoofing. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about all of them in detail. But when we depend, when we use or receive timing from the, these GNSS constellations, global navigation satellite systems, what we do, you know, we're, we're exposed to or we're subject to having line of sight to all these satellites that are in orbit that are going 
across space. I know for some of you this may be very, very old news, but I uh, just want to make sure that I set the basis. So these signals are, you know, these are medium orbit satellites, very low power, and can be easily interfered with. And there are several, several uh, causes for interference. Some of them are intentional, some of them are accidental, and there was a study back in the old days, we've been using GPS for a long time, right? So GPS has become very reliable, but every day we use it for more and more precise applications. And when we use it for more precise applications, we're a lot more susceptible to interference and to inter uh, interruptions. So that's really what has changed. Sometimes people come back to me and say, hey, you know, we've been using this for 20 years. Why is it different now? Well, we need more accuracy, and we're a lot more dependent on it. So all of these interferences have existed for, for a long time. Maybe some of these more modern spoofing techniques were not available. Maybe some of the specific satellite attacks that we are exposed to now were not so prevalent in the past, but things like environmental interference, jamming, accidental jamming, uh, uh, space debris, solar storms, volcanic eruptions, weather conditions, have always affected GNSS reception and uh, our ability to derive position, positioning and time from it. Uh, also, once we do get it, then we have a, the same study went into all of the uh, challenges when we distribute this timing. Is it accurate? How do we know it is accurate? If I don't know the time and an entity, entity gives me the time, how do, you, how do I know if it's true? So many of the IP you know, authentication techniques and security techniques still apply. We still use control access lists. We still use all of these other techniques. Uh, but it's really more of a network design, network consideration, than it is really an issue of the, of the timing source, right? Or the PTP uh, and NTP protocols, per se. Even though there is an RFC, I think, that is discussing new security requirements for PTP and NTP, but I think this, the general IT requirements apply. So I'm going to focus a little bit on, on what is protecting the source and what we can do about it. Okay. Another question is, you know, are these threats, before I go into the, the, the detail, are these threats real? Is it just news? Is it just... One thing that we have seen in the past is that these threats become more real every day. Your political conditions become more real. Uh, saturation of the space becomes more real. Uh, so they do happen, and they do happen a lot more frequently than we think they do. Actually, there's an interesting clip from CNN. It's about four or five years old. And it's a kind of a doomsday scenario of what would happen if we lost GPS. And he starts talking about, you know, how TV transmissions will start glitching, cell phones start reacting, you know, communication becomes a little bit more difficult, financial markets start, start crashing, uh, internet communication starts failing. So even traffic uh, controls like lights, train stops, uh, train schedules start to be affected, transportation. So it's kind of a doomsday scenario that we cannot imagine today, but it is possible, and it does happen occasionally in specific geographical uh, locations. Uh, one interesting one that I wanted to mention, I added, added this right before I came here, is we had a, we had a few issues in, in the Houston area, and this was as recent as late last year, and it actually persisted for several days. And I still don't know exactly what the investigation was still underway, but they couldn't figure out why we had GNSS problems all over the Houston area for several, several days in a row. This shows, this is an application that you can actually just download, it's not ours, where you can see it gives you uh, an indication of what areas in the world are being affected by, by GPS, uh, GNSS interruptions. Okay, so I'm gonna go now into uh, some of the details of what those things are, how we can mitigate the effects, and how we can protect our infrastructure 
from those type of attacks. The first one is, uh, is jamming. Jamming is one of the most frequent events that we face. They happen accidentally, mostly. There was a big case in, in, at the Newark airport a few years ago, and it would happen on a, on a weekly basis that they would lose GPS signals. And it turned out to be, after weeks or months of research, it turned out to be a logistics company driver that was using a GPS jammer on his, on his truck to prevent the company from identifying where he was going. And he would drive by the new airport, and he would affect GPS for about 15 minutes every few days. And it took them forever to, try to, to identify where the, where the problem came from. So this can be accidental, this can be intentional. To prevent, to protect from the accidental part of it, there's a lot of mechanical uh, protections that you can do. So there are antennas that are called anti-jamming antennas, which is as simple as an antenna having some filters to prevent signals that are coming from a lower elevation to interrupt or affect the signals that you're getting from up above. It doesn't fix, fix all of it, but it fixes many of the accidental cases for, for jamming. It also prevents and protects from a lot of intentional jamming events because they're usually done from the ground, but it does not prevent us from more advanced uh, type of jamming, uh, intentional jamming events such as the, the, what you can do with, from drones, from planes, which is what we see in places where there's geopolitical conflicts uh, underway. So, but that is something that for our application is very, very practical because it's very low cost. It just involves difficult, different mechanical hardware and it helps prevent or protect your GNSS-based timing sources from, uh, from interruption. A spoofing is a little bit more, uh, more complicated and a spoofing involves, uh, let's call it hacking, right? It's where we have fake GPS signals that are mal intentionally and maliciously being uh, provided so that your receiver gets confused and can use those signals as their absolute truth. So one of the interesting things that we were talking about, uh, or people were talking about earlier, is this, who do I trust? And one of the things that, the, that is being promoted by, by a group that is working on, on what is that now the new PNT, I don't know if you guys heard about it, but there's a, there was a mandate a few years ago to find a new source of timing that was not dependent on GNSS. And the US and Europe have been working on it for a few years. And the idea is, what do we do? With do we have terrestrial centers? Do we have fiber going all across? So the Department of Homeland Security and the Department of Energy have been working on it, trying to find these alternatives. And we're gonna talk a little bit about those. But part of it is, you know, the zero trust concept. Trust no one. Not your own network, not anybody else's network. Trust no one. And based on that concept, the more sources of, and this is, this is where I have the only, I guess, difference of opinion, what we, we saw from the SIMPTI report, is that it says, you know, keep your receivers separate. Our argument and the PNT initiative argument is, no, have many, many receivers with different locations, with different sources that can be uh, compared so that you can use a majority vote type of scheme to define who the, who the fake provider is. So this zero trust concept applies to you know, all of your receivers. The more sources you have, the more uh, sources of comparison you are, you're gonna have. So spoofing is difficult to, uh, how do I go back? It's more difficult to detect. Uh, it's intentional, tends to have a longer direction, uh, a lo longer duration, and it's one of the most critical aspects that we don't see here in the US as much, but we're starting to see it a little bit, uh, and that we need to protect from. And again, it's just using multiple sources. Uh, one of the things that we do, and, uh, and that has been becoming more, uh, available to protect from things like spoofing is uh, something called multi-band GNSS receivers. What these guys do is in addition to being able to work with different constellations 
of satellites, they also can use two different bands from each satellite, two different channels, with, which allow them not only to be more precise, which is a byproduct of the technology, but also to do comparisons and do a better job validating a true signal from a valid satellite system. So multi-band receivers used to be, they've been available in the military market for a long time, highly uh, accurate applications for a long time. Metrology labs would use them, but it wasn't commercially uh, uh, cost effective. So it was a balance of, you know, how often do, you ha do I have this problem and how much does it cost me to fix it? So, but now they become commercially available and at a reasonable cost. So a lot, more, a lot more applications are starting to use it. In the utility world, they're being used widely. In the telecom world, they're being used widely too because the cost is not a big impact and it doesn't require any kind of redesign of your network, just a new different type of receiver and antenna. Okay. Other sources and other things that are part of this whole PNT approach is looking for ways to distribute timing other than through the satellite networks. One thing that is, is kind of funny because I, I was reading an article from, from a company saying that we do not de depend on GNS, GNSS anymore. And it is true that they do have, and they can, they can keep time for a long time when GNSS is not available. But their original time, the absolute time, is still coming from GNSS. So basically what these initiatives are is how do we distribute that time through different methods that can be more reliable than the existing satellites? And that's when we talk about not depending on GNSS uh, per se. So one of the alternatives on this, Europe was, one, Europe was one of the leaders on this, and we're seeing it, a lot of private companies going into this market now, into this segment, is the use of LEO satellites, low orbit satellites, to provide the timing, uh, to provide timing uh, at the timing service. And I think, I mean, Wes was talking about it earlier that, or yesterday, about you know, the, the data centers not being synchronized, uh, different types of applications, how do we get PTP to different parts of the, of the world with that. These companies, uh, just like many of the cloud service providers are too, are working on how to provide PTP, how to provide timing, not only PTP, all the protocols under development, but how to provide it in alternate ways to, in, to the GNSS satellites. Another initiative is, uh, is, is, is out of the US, really, is the eLoran system. eLoran system, LoRan was a navigation system that was in place for many, many years. It went out of service. Uh, the eLoran initiative came on board. They tried to redefine the scope of the, pro the project. It lost funding for many years, and now it's being funded again because again, the, U the US is looking for an alternative source of timing because it's not, only, not only, it's not only applicable to metrology or some navigation, but even energy, and that's why the Department of Energy is heavily involved in this, is energy distribution, energy, energy generation is highly dependent on very accurate timing today. So one of the interesting things that this does, at least for this industry, is that there is at least four critical segments that are driving this development of alternate timing sources, which is energy, finance, uh, communications, and defense. So these guys are, and transportation, sorry. Defense is a totally separate thing. But anyways, we are gonna be able to benefit for some of the products that these guys uh, develop. Finally, something that has existed for a long time, and mostly for navigation, is what is called uh, augmentation systems. And these are networks that are based on terrestrial uh, stations that use very complex uh, assortment of clocks that can take GNSS references, set time, and then when they are, the reference is no longer available, they can still distribute it because they have high accuracy frequency clocks, and this is kind of what I mentioned in my question yesterday about cesium, atomic cesium clocks, that can hold time for a long time, even if they don't have an external reference. This was used primarily for navigation. They are, most of the stations are close to main important airports and, 
and those type of uh, locations, but it's something that is being studied also or included among the possible sources of uh, alternate timing. One of the things that is actually very interesting about this, though, is timing that has been free for many years may not be free in the future. And when, you talk, when I talk about the LEO satellite system, that's a subscription model. You pay for your time. And when, they, when you talk about uh, to the, some of the cloud service providers, that's probably going to be a subscription, a service model too. The, because they are already in the process of synchronizing their data centers. But if you want to get the service of time, then you're going to have to pay for it. Something that in the old TDM world we didn't worry about because it was part of the signal, right? So we could recover time from the signal. Um, so anyway, this is what you can do to protect from, a, from these interferences that may happen. Other things that you do need to do is you, do need to do, you need to do monitoring. And this becomes very hard when you have one or two GNSS isolated GNSS receivers. But as you have a network of GNSS receivers, the monitoring part becomes a very, very important part of the process to validate whether the source that you're receiving is true uh, by using comparison methods uh, and to be able to detect you know, uh, fake sources to be, to be accepted as a, as, as a reference to your network. So this is something that is not, it's not easy to do because it's very dynamic. So one of the things that we've been seeing and we and many others are working on today is using machine language, artificial intelligence, to be able to detect these attacks before they do have an impact on us. And how do we do this? Well, we take historical data, you know, power levels, signal to noise ratios, uh, information that comes from all these satellites that we're seeing today and we can compare it to how they be performed yesterday, two weeks ago, two months ago, and be able to determine whether it is the same source that is sending the signal or is somebody trying to fake a valid GNSS uh, satellite. Not only that, but it also helps us in many other ways, right? Uh, especially when we talk about some of the locations where we put GPSs today, the topology around it, around us changes. Buildings are, are uh, build <laughs> next to us, you know, walls are built, electric equipment is put on the roof next to the antenna, trees grow, and all of these things happen over time and we don't realize it until we finally are affected by the effects of it. And we know that even seconds of a timing failure, depending on the application, can be pretty significant uh, in terms of money, okay? So this is one of the, I think one of the interesting, most interesting things that we're working on in the industry, and again, applicable, applicable to many other sectors, but I think it will benefit from us. Another interesting thing that you need to consider is, okay, I'm telling you that all these things are gonna happen to you one time, at one time or another, so what do I do, right? Oh, I have my multiband receiver, but you're telling me it's not a good fix. One of the important things to understand is what you really need, and this is where some of the discussions that we had uh, earlier in the week you know, do I need one microsecond? Do I need 10 microseconds? Do I need 100 milliseconds? Well, depending on what you need, there's different type of uh, tools or elements that you can use to try to protect your network, your infrastructure from being affected. And this is just a quick example of, you know, what different oscillators can do in terms of holding different types of time accuracy. And you will find that from, you know, in the specs of any oscillator manufacturer. But with that, you can make a decision. What do I need? You know, what's my recovery plan? Oh, I can hold three days, even if GPS fails, then you know, I, I don't need to spend a lot of money on, a, on, a, on an oscillator, a high quality oscillator. Another concept, and this is not, I didn't think this was a valid concept for the broadcast industry until the presentation yesterday from Microsoft because I always thought that this was overkill. You know, the, the use of atomic clocks and we're using it in telecom, we're using it, using it in metrology, we're using it in energy. But I thought it was, you know, kind of not 
cost proportionate. But listening to the presentation yesterday, it makes a lot of sense. And what this does, you know, when you start using these high stability clocks that are the ones used by the metrology centers, that now today are not as, as expensive as they, or as big as they used to be, then you can take a, your monitoring or your central clock distribution center and you can work independently of GNSS receivers for months and maintain one microsecond precision in your timing uh, generation, not your timing distribution, but in your timing generation. So concepts like this that I really didn't think had an application in this industry, looking at some of the data center architecture that's been deployed uh, becomes, uh, it becomes in play, it really does, okay? And the other part is, and the other the thing where I, that I mentioned earlier about uh, the SIMT report is, we do think that resiliency using multiple receivers can be achieved. You do have to work on the protection, on the, on the, on the IP side, on the Ethernet side, but if you do implement a secure network, which you have to anyways, for all your other content, then you can use PTP as a method to protect uh, your timing infrastructure between sites. I think this is the most important message from that. And then monitoring, of course, you know, if you're checking, you're pro providing timing to a bunch of infrastructure, the least you should do is be able to monitor if your network is still distributing timing as accurately as you plan. And you may not need to monitor every site, but you need to have some thermometers across the network to be able to determine whether your network distribution is working. Uh, and this slide, I added it at the very last minute because I, I thought it'd be interesting as a summary. So I removed the cl conclusions and I added this slide and it says, you know, you need, you have four levels of detection and this is out of the PNT program from the Department of Homeland Security. You have your antenna protection. How do I make sure that my antenna can receive the best possible signal? Uh, and we can use anti-jamming and anti-spoofing, and, and, and I mentioned that earlier. Then the receiver selecting what a good signal is, right? Then at the, and at the system level, at the device level, being able to compare multiple sources and try to define which one is the rogue master or the rogue uh, GNSS signal. And then at the network management level is, how do I use all this data when I have hundreds of thousands of GNSS receivers across my network? How do I use this data to tell me that a problem is coming before it happens? So again, it's all, it all depends on the infrastructure you are trying to uh, protect, the investments you're willing to make, and the requirements for precision and a, an authentication that you may have. And with that, I take any questions? Please, go ahead, Kier. Um, for, forgive me if this is a naive question on a complicated topic, but um, what stops a manufacturer from building a device that can take in all these different time sources and essentially vote to knock one out if it's bad, or knock multiple out if they're bad. Because in, in many data centers, like, like Telehouse in London, you can buy atomic clock over fiber. It's, it's not cheap because it's for the financial traders. But you can buy a bunch of sources. And um, what, what precludes a manufacturer from building a device that can just figure out which ones are being jammed or have issues? What? Uh what prevents us from doing that, or what prevents a manufacturer from, do, yeah. from being able to tell automatically which one is? Yeah, if, if you've got, say, eight different, you know, you've got the European system, the US GNSS, the, oh, you can't use the Chinese ones here, but we can use the Chinese ones, Russian ones, atomic clock over fiber, and, and use a kind of vote. Oh, I, no, yeah, nothing prevents a manufacturer from doing that. Uh, and that's actually what we're proposing that you do that, and that's what the PNT group is proposing too. The problem is that the cost of integrating, yeah, I can get Galileo and GLONASS and GPS, but they're all satellite based, right? Yeah. So then I need to have an atomic clock. It's a different cost. Then I have a couple of PTP sources 
different cost. Then I take in a NTP from NIST. Yes, that's a different source and a, dif yeah, and a different pay service. So you can do all of this, and this is what we suggest people do. But in the real world today, not many people are doing that, even though as a box, the box exists. It's just that the sources yeah. are not readily available. And that's what, what they're trying to do with Leo too. Now in this box, and if you look at some of the receivers today, you can put Leo in, you can put GLONASS, GPS, a Galileo, a one pulse per second out of a ZSIM clock, yeah. and compare all of those. Yeah. So uh, for, for reference, when Joe Biden arrived at the Queen's funeral, everyone using GNSS to synchronize their oscillators failed. I'm sorry, I couldn't give the last part. He said uh, at, on the presentation he did for Queen's funeral, everyone was using GNSS. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and when Joe Biden arrived, things went wrong. Yes, for sure. And, and it's, you know, it's the cheapest way to do it, right? Please. We uh, operate, on behalf of the BBC, a time signal in the radio for long wave, which, amongst other things, changes energy, electricity meters, changes their tariff. Now, that has been there for a long time. It's going to have to come to an end at some point, And we're trying to find other ways to fund that. The problem we have is GPS is free. And nobody sees that it's a threat. So we can't actually find a new funding model. So it's both a question, because you put it up there briefly. But if, do you have any comments on how you think a funding model for, for timing services may evolve in the future? I have some opinions, uh, but yeah, the, right now, at least in the US, and I know that in Europe there's a, there's a similar initiative moving, and the, I think I put it up there, the European Space Agency is driving one of those projects to be able to provide timing through these LEO satellites. And, you know, it's early stages, but I actually saw an article just a couple of weeks ago where they did a press release of you know, first satellite being launched or something like that. So that is underway. What we see today is a mix of public and private funding. Okay, and what we see happening in the US, again, the Department of Energy, Department of Homeland Security, together with some private entities are working on kind of a hybrid type of architecture. On the other hand, well, at least GPS, GPS will continue to exist and it's undergoing a massive renovation, you know, new satellites, a higher power, more uh, security. So, and these satellites are going up in the air now. So that is also evolving. Mm. But, uh, you know, you're going to be continuing to be exposed to, to the external effects. So, I mean, right now, here, they were talking about just fiber everywhere, right? Use fiber, the fiber that uh, utility companies have to just interconnect the country to distribute timing over fiber. But that's as its uh, you know, weaknesses too. But on the, in Europe, it's underway. And I can, I, if you send me an email, I'll send you some info, because our guys from Europe have been involved in that too. So, so, so it's my understanding that um, ATSC3 um, signals generate a very accurate clock um, in, in, the, in the broadcast space. And the reason why I understand that is that um, you can use a, an ATSC3 signal to augment your GPS signal inside an automobile and get the accuracy of your location from meters down to like 30 centimeters. Um, is that something that you've considered? Have you heard anything about that? Is, can people pick up timing from a television network? Ye yes, um, but let's, keep re let's remember though that the, the satellite transmission for the ATSC signal is GPS based. Sure. The clock. So, but yeah, that has been, and also the discussion about 5G. Not only 5G providing PTP, but actually deriving timing directly from the, from the no, 5G. No, no, no. I, I guess what I'm saying is that, presuming that not every television station in the market is equally subject to, to jamming or whatever, you know, that would be a, another backup source that you could get to. Okay, yeah. You know, no, I have not heard anything. Okay. At least a part of this project, I haven't heard anything about okay. uh, using it yet. Yeah, interesting. All right. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate you. your time. Interesting presentation. <laughs>